Listen only mode. Hello everyone, this is Frank Salatis and uh, welcome to the webinar. Thank you for joining. I know we have uh, quite a few people registered and we're still seeing people uh, join it. Uh, we are going to get started in just about less than a minute. Um, <clears throat> I have a few opening comments to make uh, that is re in relation to International Project Management Day and about portfolio management uh, before I turn it over to uh, Mr. Peter Heinrich from uh, PDWare. I, I think it's going to be a very informative session. Uh, we're looking at things from a more practical session, uh, practical point of view than uh, from a theoretical point of view and we'll actually see some, some interesting uh, demo of, of how uh, resource planning actually works. So it's going to be kind of an interesting thing. You are all in a uh, a silent mode, meaning that any questions or comments that you uh, wish to offer will be sent via the chat box or the question box. And what we will do is, as we go through the presentation, we'll be scanning those questions and if there is a timely point, we will uh, ask uh, Peter some of those questions and if not, we will uh, address those questions near the end of the program. So uh, with that, I just want to uh, again say thank you and uh, welcome to another installment of the International Project Management Day uh, webinar series. Okay, and my name is Frank Salatis and I actually organized uh, International Project Management Day uh, with an idea back in 2004 and it's grown uh, quite a bit. So I thought I would do a, a very quick recap. Uh, International Project Management Day is the first Thursday of November uh, every year and uh, just to uh, make sure that we understand the purpose of the day. It's not a celebration of project management. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do in, in terms of um, improving how projects are performed and, and there are still a number of, uh, of, of, of issues associated with uh, successfully completing projects. Um, studies show the, the PMI pulse of the profession and PWC's uh, state of project management tell us that uh, even today with all the technology that we have, with all of the um, uh, methodologies and equipment and tools and best practices and so on, but only about 44% of, of capital projects are achieving their strategic objectives. And another kind of a startling fact is that for every one billion dollars spent on capital projects, approximately 100 million dollars is wasted. So uh, I just want to point out that we're, we're really not celebrating project management, we are recognizing project managers for their continued, continued work towards finding the best ways to add value to an organization and to achieve the objectives of the projects that will create um, a sustainable future for uh, the organization. So it's, it's really not a celebration, it's a day of recognition for project managers and uh, to, for, for, for many of us, and I've said this many times in, in multiple programs and presentations that I've given, that the project management is, is often reviewed as the unappreciated profession. So this day is really a day of appreciation and a thank you to project managers. And in uh, uh, 2015, uh, there were multiple sessions and events all around the world. Uh, many organizations, we even had a, a governor of Missouri proclaim uh, International Project Management Day, which was announced in St. Louis on uh, November 5th, and I was there as a guest speaker. Uh, we've had multiple organizations having events internally, like Alcatel-Lucent as an example, and uh, even the International Institute for Learning had another major event, an all-day program, uh, which was uh, designed to uh, basically promote the value of project management. So we had a number of things going on that day and it really is simply about the efforts and significant work performed by project managers and that we all do make a difference. And my, my initial quote about International Project Management Day, which I have built on, was that you can see the value of project management in any skyline. So all of you that are project managers out there, uh, IPM Day was your day. Hopefully people came up to you and thanked you for the work that you do and gave you some feeling of appreciation. And that's what it's all about. Now, um, <clears throat> we'll talk very, very quickly about portfolio management before I turn it over to Peter. I kind of like this quote, uh, Pat Durbin and Terry uh, Dor Dorsher uh, wrote this book, Taming Change with Portfolio Management. Uh, modern organizations are defined by how their knowledge workers use ideas and information to create value. And these webinar series 
are, are intended to do that, to give you information, to help you to uh, be more innovative, to start thinking about ways to improve how you're getting things done in the projects that you work on. And specifically today we're talking about portfolio management and, and resource planning. So what is portfolio management? Uh, as the slide says, we're synchronizing the significant effort of selecting, prioritizing, and managing projects with the agreed upon and expressed vision and mission of the enterprise. Very important. Let's make sure that we are picking the right projects that are going to add the, the greatest business value to the organization. We need the appropriate mix of projects, and that includes the financials and the risks associated with it. And we also have to really make sure we understand that while we're working on projects, that we have to maintain our business and our operational functions. So operations is actually part of the portfolios that we are working on. Now, Harvey Levine wrote a book, Project Portfolio Management. This is a, several years ago that he wrote the book, but uh, I, pull, I pulled two key items out of that book that I thought were very important and uh, worth mentioning. Optimizing the use of limited funds and resources and support of missions and strategies is vital for survival. And one of the things that, that Peter will be talking about is that, that even today, again, with all the technology that we have and all the methods and procedures, that uh, we are still having great difficulty in managing our resources and creating a, um, a level of, of efficiency that will provide the value that we're looking for. And of course, um, project portfolio management assumes that the enterprise positions itself for increased strength and profitability through its selection and execution of projects. We have to have a very specific set of criteria that are used to make sure that the projects that are going into the pipeline are vetted properly in terms of things like net present value or internal rate of return, payback period. And in, even more importantly, some of the what we call non-financial benefits that are associated with projects that we are actually selecting. So it's a big job. We get a lot of things that we want to talk about. But the important thing here is that we want to make sure that the projects always align with organizational strategies. Make sure that everybody at the project level, at the program level, and at the portfolio level understands the organization's strategies, vision, mission, and goals. Okay, We want to make sure that, that the projects that we work on are also associated and consistent with the culture and the values of the organization. Okay, And it also has a lot to do with your organizational structure. But one of the things you should think about is if someone was to ask you, you know, tell me about your organization, what kind of a culture is it? Um, I bet you find that a little bit difficult to, to answer. Uh, are you a team-based culture? Are you a culture based on being averse to risk? You know, things like that. And, and what are the things that your, your management and your people value? So it's not just value in terms of financials for the projects that you work on, but it also has a lot to do with what the value system is within the, pro within the organization. These are all factors that have to be considered when you're not only selecting projects, but you're managing projects, and then determining whether or not projects should be either completed or to be uh, removed or, or discontinued uh, based on uh, that set of values and also some of the uh, uh, economic models that you might be using in terms of uh, uh, adjusting or uh, assessing performance. We want to make sure that everything that we do is, is considered, every project and every program is considered an, a financial investment. Okay, and we want to find a way to make sure that these projects and programs are either directly or indirectly adding to positive cash flow, either now or in the future and in the, maybe in the long-term future. And we want to make sure, and this is the key thing, that projects must be effectively, uh, well, we should be effectively using the resources, the people, the infrastructure, and other types of resources that make uh, that help us to, to maximize the value uh, of the organization. So these are just s some of the very uh, uh, high-level uh, specifics uh, about uh, portfolio management, things that we should all be aware of. Uh, they're kind of fundamental in the portfolio management process. And, and with that, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Peter to, uh, to take over. He's going to now share his screen and introduce himself.
And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about achieving business value through project portfolio management and resource planning. So, so Peter, welcome, and, and thank you for being a part of our program. Uh, well, thank you, Frank. <clears throat> I appreciate the invitation, and uh, thank you to all of you for attending. Uh, I hope this is of considerable value to you. Uh, so before I start, I'd like to uh, give a brief summary of my background uh, so that you have some idea of the context for my comments. Um, many, many years ago, in the 70s, I started as an operating system software developer, uh, then was a first level resource manager and project manager. Uh, in the 80s, I discovered or was introduced to project management and became a, an enthusiast, if not a fanatic. And uh, at some point in the late 80s, I left Xerox and uh, formed with uh, some colleagues a project management consulting and training firm. <clears throat> And uh, we not only did the training, but we did the consulting in the sense of trying to implement a good project management practices on major programs with our clients. And in the course of that, we, and I in particular, discovered some uh, fairly substantial gaps, things that weren't working quite the way we wanted them to work. So uh, with that uh, sort of introduction for my background, uh, let me comment about business value. A, a former uh, CEO of mine um, once said, hey, a business value, what is that? That's profit. What is profit? Profit is the difference between two very big numbers, the cost side and the revenue side. And what is true is that projects and project execution and portfolio management bear on both sides of those that equation. So the, you have to get the projects, they deliver the value, and the project costs money. The primary cost for most organizations is labor cost. So the resource side of it is critically important. And what we were discovering in the 90s was that we could do a great job doing the planning on an individual project, but in the context of the whole portfolio, the organization tended to run into terrible problems. So let's talk about that. And the first thing I want to do is say, what is resource portfolio resource planning? So it's a method for answering key questions to uh, support good decisions within the organization. So it's really operational. So the first question, given the people we have and their skills, what projects can we do? What can we do with these people and when can we do it? So that's one side of the problem. The other side of the problem is given a set of projects that we really must do or want to do, how many people of each skill do we need and when do we need them? And then beyond those planning questions, there's the question of how well are we utilizing the people we have? Do we have a lot of people sitting on the bench? Do we have a lot of people overloaded? What's our utilization picture? And then very, very important, what do we do when demand or capacity changes? And that happens all the time to almost all organizations. So these two aspects of resource planning, demand utilization planning and oversight, and in addition to what's the best achievable portfolio with the resources, how do we monitor these changes to optimize that utilization? And then taking a somewhat longer perspective, capability or staff planning, given a set of projects in the future we need in order to achieve the organization's objectives, or conversely, given a sudden spending limit, what changes to the resource skill profile are needed for the organization going forward? So what is the problem? How does the problem manifest? Now, I'm going to give you some quotes. These are quotes that I've heard for years and years and years, but many of them I have heard 
as recently as the last three or four months. So these are not uh, historical artifacts. These are current issues. So what does a project manager say when asked about the problem? Well, I don't get the promised resources at the right time. I go through a phase gate. I start my project. I start with five people. I'm supposed to have 15 in three months. We get out three months, and I've only got 10. Uh, and I'm not given the opportunity to change scope or schedule when that happens. And furthermore, scope changes all the time, and I don't get changes to my resource or schedule uh, plan. Now, one of the things that I didn't say at the beginning, and I'll say right now, which is a theme uh, for all of this, is that the key missing element in all of this is the functional or resource manager, the person who has 3, 5, 10, 15 people reporting to him or her. And so what is it that the functional managers say? Well, management doesn't set priorities, and they're always asking us to do more without considering what we're currently working on. And even more serious in a way, because the functional managers are frequently left out of the formal planning process, a phase gate will occur and a project will be approved, and a functional manager will say afterwards, hey, I never agreed to provide all those people at this point in time. I've got so many other things to do. So they haven't been integrated into the planning process. Now, there are other players who have problems with portfolio resource planning. And that would be the portfolio managers and the executive managers. And again, I say to you, these are literally quotes that I have heard senior managers say. The first one is shocking, but true. I don't have a clue what people are working on. And I heard this recently at a $3 billion a year company. We start all kinds of projects, but we don't finish them. I can't tell if we're focused on the high priority projects. We kill projects. They keep coming back. And in boom times, when things are going really well financially, or in bad times, when things are not going well, we don't know what skills to cut or add when the budgets are changed. And Many organizations have gone through across-the-board cuts that are just awful. They have a terrible impact because they are not considering the essentially resource-critical path, the resources that are in uh, that have the key to the performance of an overall portfolio. So these are very, very serious problems. Now I'm going to show you a resource plan that I did in the 70s. And it's uh, quite a unique thing in that it is still in use. Uh, this was a piece of graph paper. And at the time I did this, I had no idea what a resource plan was. My boss came to me and said, we're doing our annual operating plan. Um, do a resource plan. And I said, what's a resource plan? He said, well, take all your people and take all the projects you have to do and figure out how much uh, each person is going to work on each project in each month of this year. So I did that. You can see what I did. I said Alice is working on Cedar and Antigua, and I put in the numbers and said she'd be working so and so much in each of these periods, and I did that for each of the resources. Now this uh, method of resource planning has some very, very serious problems. Uh, and I can assure you that I've made every mistake that it's possible to make in this arena, including in project management, but also in resource planning. Um, what I did when a new project was added, I went, got out my eraser, <clears throat> and I made all the numbers come out right. So if I knew I had uh, seven people or eight people in a given period, I spread those eight over the projects that I was asked to support without regard to whether or not the project could be successfully completed with those different lower values. So you can tell right away there are significant problems with this method. 
But I assure you that this method is still being used today, not on graph paper. It's being done in Excel. But this is, in a way, the preferred method for functional managers to do resource plans. And it's a very good method if it's embodied in the right process and the right tool set. So what was wrong with that planning process? Well, all of the other functional managers did their plans, and we racked up the total headcount demand, the total work months required for each project. We organized the project in this prioritized list, and we put in the cumulative headcount required going down the list. So that my CEDAR project took 44.4 work months, and I had 92 or so uh, work months on Barbados. So my cumulative total is 136.95, and so on. And we knew we had about 450 uh, work months of headcount for the year. And so we drew a cut line when we got uh, above uh, 449. And we said, OK, we can't support these other projects, but we can do all 16 of the top ones. Well, what's the problem with this? Well, it's a terrible problem because resource planning, portfolio resource planning, is a multi-dimensional problem. It's not a single-dimensional problem. And so the, the main problem here is that it didn't take into account the profile of demand. So if you look at January cumulatively going down, the 32 resources we had on board could support all the way down to project number 22. And that was true all the way out to May, when all of a sudden the profile of demand changed. And then as you get out further in the year, all of these projects from number 10 down to number 16 that we approved ran into resource shortfall that had the obvious and predictable impact on quality and schedule. And this is a very real example of a problem uh, with a single cut line, a simple-minded solution to the resource planning problem. Now, this alone, just taking into account the profile of resource demand, does not fully comprehend the issues because this would be this that would be true that it would comprehend all of the issues if all the resources were equally interchangeable if there were no skill issues involved if all the resources were fungible but they aren't and in fact these projects require multiple skills now in order to demonstrate that i'm going to uh, show you uh, our software. And this, what we're looking at, is a prioritized list of all the projects in the portfolio. And the numbers are the total demand in each period divided by the, uh, uh, sorry, the total ability to provide demand from the resource pool. So the BVSC project here can get 100% of what it needs for all periods. And you would expect the projects at the bottom of the list to not get everything they need. But some of the projects near the top of the list are not getting everything they need. For instance, Blockbuster here is only getting 86% of what it needs in April. Why is that? How could that be? So for analysis, we double click on Blockbuster, and we see the resource plan for Blockbuster. And here are all the skill requirements for Blockbuster, and here are the people assignments on Blockbuster. And you can see from the color highlighting that we are unable to provide 100% of the one FTE architect in April, and we're unable to provide one FTE of DBA in March and April. 
And furthermore, even with a person who's been assigned or allocated 50% here to this project, we are unable to provide all of that. And so the natural question is why? And double click again, and we see all of the assignments for Bill Brophy. And we can see why he, uh, he cannot provide 100% of the 0.5 to Blockbuster because he's being consumed at a level of 0.8 on the higher priority BDSC project. So what that means is we looked at the allocation percent of demand and drilled down to the resource plan issues and from there to resource assignment conflicts. And so that kind of analysis is required to demonstrate that you have the skills and people at the right time to support the accomplishment of these projects. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of the solutions and look at a picture of how you would have to organize to support operational excellence in your portfolio management. So in terms of the history of processes, uh, organization breakdown structures go back thousands of years, literally. I'll show you that in a second. In the, nine, the 1950s, we had the development of modern project management. Uh, in fact, uh, a, uh, a teacher of uh, Frank's uh, was a colleague and friend of mine, Russ Archibald, was one of the founders of this whole process in the 1950s. Uh, in the 1960s, life cycle processes were really being rapidly developed, uh, portfolio management in the 80s and 90s, and now we're looking at what we call portfolio resource planning and management. So here is the thousands of year old organization breakdown structure. I found this on an Egyptian website. Uh, these hieroglyphs. Are, are contemporaneous. They, these represent something the Egyptians themselves did uh, to structure one of the crews working on the Great Pyramid. Uh, each of the dots at the bottom represents a group of 20 men. Uh, the dots above that are, let's say, uh, directors of departments. Uh, the dots above that, the two here for the friends of Menkori and the drunkards of Menkori groups are the vice presidents, and here's the general manager at the top. So this stuff has been going on for a very, very long time. So we humans are trying to get this right. We're still not there. Now I want to ask you uh, to just think about this for a second and answer the question, how many project managers are there? in the US and in the world. And I had the good fortune of looking, trying to verify some of my assumptions, and I found the PMI 2015 Global Job Report. So here are the answers. Approximately 5.5 million project managers in the United States alone. Approximately 28 million in 10 major countries including the US, but not including, I believe, Europe. Uh, it did include the UK, and it included Australasia. And the PMI uh, Global Job Report predicts 41 million <coughs> project managers in these 10 major countries by 2020, and that's not far off. And so for purposes of sort of looking at performance versus cost, uh, I'm going to assume about 10 million PMs in the US, UK, Europe, and Australasia. And on that basis, the spending on project management is staggering. We're spending about 10 billion a year on expenses, tools, training, conferences, and so on. And at the 100,000 per year burdened compensation, that 
10 million PMs is costing a trillion dollars a year, 550 billion in the US alone. And that's only a small number of the overall PMs in the world. So given that, how well are we doing? Well, Frank referred to these surveys by PMI and PricewaterhouseCooper. I looked at them. <clears throat> and somewhere around 40, 45%, well, actually 45% is the average underperformance, where underperformance is defined as failing one or more of scope, schedule, and cost. So 45% of projects underperforming. If you look at a graph of that, and you go back historically looking at similar surveys, I'm finding that the underperformance rate is remaining quite high. Back in 1998, 48%, then it goes down to 42 and 45, and either 40 or 45, depending on how you count, in 2014. And if you overlay on that a log graph of what amounts to spending on project management, in this line is the number of project managers who are either PMPs or PMI members. But the real number in the US is five times the, uh, this um, chart. So it goes up to 10 million, or 5.5 million, sorry. Um, we're getting very little overall improvement for the magnitude of the spending we're doing. So why is that? Well, for one thing, there's no magic bullet. When I first uh, encountered project management and was so wildly enthusiastic in the 80s, I thought it was the solution that was going to fix all of these problems. But of course, th th there is no magic bullet. Uh, there's a human element. Uh, people are human. They make decisions without considering things. They're, uh, they're inconsistent and so on. Um, there's turnover, loss of culture and discipline, lack of data, all of those things. But most importantly, we haven't integrated all the necessary processes in a sustainable system. That means simple enough, efficient enough, easy enough to use that it is sustainable over time. Now, project management serves us well. I'm still as enthusiastic about project management as I was when I first encountered it. But it's not the answer by itself to this problem. There is no credible resource plan for a portfolio from a collection of project plans. For one thing, they're too detailed, and they get out of date very quickly. Another issue is that there's inconsistent compliance and quality in the development of those plans and in keeping them up to date. It, typically, they don't include non-project work, but by far the most important reason that project management alone can't do this is that it doesn't fully integrate the resource or functional manager in the process and have the functional manager responsible for those demand numbers. So the missing element, we need a clear data provider role for resource managers. And we need to use that data all the time, essentially, in portfolio reviews, phase gate reviews, operations reviews, the annual operating plan, and so on. Uh, and by the way, this missing element assumes that the other elements are there, specifically that here is a view of a full functional operational portfolio management process where we have project management, life cycle, phase gate, agile, whatever, as our methodologies. And we have this robust resource planning process and a capacity demand management process. And we have a well-defined role for the functional manager and the resource management leg of the stool here, or a triangle. The project managers do what we all know project managers do. The portfolio managers take the data and the analysis that's provided by the project managers, the resource managers, and the enterprise PMO. And they make the four 
decisions that the management team has to make in order to maximize the results from a portfolio. The four decisions are approve a project, two, delay a project, three, kill a project, and four, provide enough resource to make the project successful if it needs more than what it has previously planned. So those are the four decisions. That's all it takes from the management team. Those are the hard decisions, of course. And the hardest of all would be the kill and the add resources. So the two that the management team is most likely to make, obviously in most cases they're likely to make the approve a project. That's the major problem is that too many projects are approved. Uh, and the second one is delay a project when they get in trouble. So the checklist for a successful process is to capture fresh, credible demand data from the resource managers and, by the way, capture fresh, credible project data, that is, schedule, critical project parameters, and status, and deliverables from the project managers. So capture fresh, credible data. Demonstrate that you can finish everything you start using a prioritized supply demand analysis. Require a contract at the phase gates. When a project goes through the phase gate, this should not be just an informational thing. At least one or pr probably more, but at least one phase gate should be a contract phase gate where everyone, the PMs, the resource managers, and the executive team all sign up to deliver the resources required, the project managers sign up to deliver the results required. And if you have such a contract and you don't do item number four, it's worthless. So you need to track, measure, review, and respond to issues. So as I showed earlier with the tool, if you have a portfolio that has a lot of color in it, indicating resource gaps, skill gaps, you better take care of those gaps and get that color out of there, or you have a portfolio that is going to have quality or schedule problems or scope problems. And finally, keep it simple. Uh, if you put in a five-foot shelf of books and require everybody to spend half their time doing process, you won't get compliance, first of all. People will just uh, blow it off and not do it. Uh, and even if you get it started, it will wither and die eventually because the effort involved is not perceived to be worth the gain. So keeping it relatively simple, as lightweight as possible, but as effective as possible is the key to sustainability. So in other words, a simple, sustainable data collection process with the data coming from the right people, accountability. Before approving a project, demonstrate you have the right skills when they're needed. Regular, consistent management review of the analysis and data and capture and use this information. So the takeaway here is that portfolio resource planning is critical. Nothing works well without it. You win big if you do it. And it's not so hard to do it well. But it does require this consistency, discipline, and the right tools. Now, many people <coughs> think that putting in place a process like this requires a high level of maturity and oh we're not we're not sophisticated enough and we're not organized enough in fact the opposite is the case a, a an appropriate resource planning tool is a key method for getting better at all of those things at calling up the maturity level you don't have to be highly mature to do it you will never get to be highly mature if you don't do it. And so the right place to start, and in fact one of our products is called Resource First, 
is to start with resource planning at the portfolio level. Now, I will point out to you that there is a resource planning summit conference. It's the premier conference for resource planning. There are world-class speakers and content and lots of people who are doing it and lots of people who are not doing it and are sharing their difficulties and problems. But in particular, there are lots of people who are doing the resource planning and portfolio planning and doing it very successfully and sharing their, their approaches. The uh, 2016 venue is New York City on the Intrepid uh, carrier, uh, docked in the Hudson. Uh, we are providing uh, PDU credits. We're a sponsor of it. And uh, you can register at resourceplanningsummit.com. And if you have any interest in exploring further these uh, topics and these issues and, and the, the solutions, uh, you can always get to us through www.pdware.com. Uh, we are a, a service provider, a solution provider, uh, software and services in this arena. And just as a bonus for those of you who choose to download the slide deck, I've included some additional slides I'm not going to go through here, one of which is, whoops, <laughs> sorry, is my references slide. Um, here it is, um, where I have uh, I cite some of the references that have informed some of the ideas that I've talked to you about, in particular some of the reasons why managers and people make bad decisions. Uh, some of that is in the behavioral economics arena. Uh, and others, uh, like Leading Product Development by Wheelwright Clark, are some of the great works in, uh, in this area of management of portfolios. So that's, uh, that's it for uh, the present, my part of the presentation. Uh, Frank, do we have any questions? Okay, so uh, I am, I'm looking to see what questions we might have. Uh, one of them was, um, <clears throat> can we have a copy of the presentation? So uh, uh, I defer that to you, Peter. Is that something, this uh, slide deck, is that something that you might offer in case anybody wants to look at it in more detail or, or have some questions yep. they email you directly? Absolutely, yes. We will provide a copy of the slide deck. Okay. Um, other than that, I don't see any other specific questions regarding uh, portfolio management. What I'm going to do, uh, and maybe to prompt a few questions, um, I'm switching over so that I can we can see my screen, and uh, I am going to uh, take a look at a particular presentation. I want to just share one little thing on it that kind of summarizes what uh, portfolio management is, and then see if we can't get. Um, a couple of questions going here before we close out. Um, <clears throat> one, one slide here, just real quick on this, is <clears throat> you do need to have an, an environment for, for project success or project management success. Uh, and, and this particular model here, let me just put it up in the slide uh, show format. Okay, one more thing here. Okay, hopefully that's going to come up. All right, and I will yep. move. So can you see that? Now, this is very quick. Um, <clears throat> what we need to do in order to have a good project, a successful project environment is a number of things here. Top personnel uh, have to have good education in project management, a career path, uh, mentorship, compensation that's compatible uh, with what the, 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 the skill levels of the project managers are, standardized process tools and equipment. Uh, we need to have people following a certain approach and that begins at the very, very top level of the organization. And if we standardize standardized things, what we would have here is a lot of consistency within the organization. You have to be uh, compatible with your business processes. One of the things that we want to do is make sure that project managers and, project pr and, and program managers uh, understand the other elements of business. So one of the things I'm always uh, suggesting to project managers and program managers is get to know your business. Uh, a friend of mine, Gary Herkins, um, wrote a book entitled The Business Savvy Project Manager. And this really is, is, has an awful lot to do with portfolio management uh, in that it, it begins with the strategic elements of, of managing projects. And he, and he starts his book out with a quote that says, you know, it really doesn't matter 
how well you manage a project, if it's on time within budget and according to scope, if it's the wrong project. So let's make sure we're selecting the right projects. But then you, you're selecting the right projects, you're going to have to make sure that the projects are prioritized. And I think Peter made some key points on that uh, earlier in the presentation about, you know, are we really working on the right projects and do we have our resources working on those things that are most critical to the organization? Uh, we encourage, of course, project management certification of some type, whether it's PMI or um, IPMA or, or many of the other certifications that are out there. You should have a project evaluation review process in place. And that means that as projects and programs are progressing, that you should be doing interim checks to make sure that they are still producing the business value. Because if they are not, if, if uh, models have changed, if, if conditions have changed within the organization, we need to be moving those resources to those projects that are providing the, the value that we're looking for. Okay? You're always in continuous improvement. Okay? You need to have a good, solid portfolio management process. Uh, you absolutely, positively need to have executive support. It's got to be very visible executive support. And with all of these put together, you would have what is known as uh, at least the beginnings of a successful enterprise uh, project environment. Now, I wanted to do one more thing here, and I'm just going through these slides so we can get to a, a key point and then we will see if there's any other questions but what I did was I took portfolio management and I kind of condensed it down into three slides three slides that really cover what it is if you think about it up in the left hand corner it's strategic goals do you fully understand uh, your strategic goals vision mission and organizational goals and objectives okay from there we take a look at project ideas and recommendations and business solutions but we're not we have to really look at it from two two factors we have what we call uh, environmental uh, environmental and organizational factors and you can see a list there customer needs compliance economic environment financial capacity sustainability brand recognition risk sensitivity those are uh, you know about the organization have a lot to do with your culture and how you actually manage business and and your value principles but you also have to be aware of the human factors what's the morale of your company like you know what's the trust level between management and uh, people that are doing work, you know how loyal are your your, your employees? Uh, what's your your environment for innovation and creativity? What's the risk sensitivity of the people that are working with you? And how business savvy are they? You put all that together, and then you have to go through your project selection process. So these are factors to consider, and now you have the more economic models. You know the cost benefit analysis, tangible benefits, net present value, return on investment, internal rate of return, and so on. Okay. We also have to consider, and this is a very important part, the intangible or what we call the non-financial benefits of the projects that you're working on. All of these things have to be taken into consideration when you're assessing uh, the, uh, the feasibility or whether or not a project should be selected, including the risks associated with the project. Now, once you do that, the selection outcome will be either you're accepting projects, you're deferring them, or you're simply rejecting them. And there usually will be some, some specific details about why projects are deferred and rejected. Uh, those that are accepted are entered into portfolios. Most organizations have different, different buckets. There might be compliance projects and programs, uh, interdependent projects independent R&D, uh, different types of projects that will go in there, operations. So what we have to do is take a look at the very, very big picture of everything that's going into the, the planning process at the high level, at the strategic level. And then you'll see prioritization and resource requirements. And this is where we seem to have a lot of problems. And I, I used a quote from uh, Dr. Harold Kirsner, who has said uh, in his book that 90% of project-related problems are caused by people, not by machines, tools, and equipment. So, and I think Peter alluded to that too. That we we are, we've been working on this. I mean, uh, project management has been around for 2,000 years, and we still haven't gotten it right yet. And a lot of it has to do with how we manage people, putting the right people with the right skills in the right projects. So, your project and uh, your your portfolios. Uh, have your compliance projects and your programs and so on, and you're going to use an enterprise methodology for project management. What are the tools and the techniques? Do you have a resource planning tool in place that you can assess how your projects are doing, what the condition of your, your uh, resource pool is, the availability, do we have the right resources in the right place, and so on. Okay, using some type of an enterprise software certainly will add to the consistency. Uh, 
put, putting all that together, we have to continue to check status. We have to take a look at projects. We use a dashboard approach so we can get very quick information about project and program health. We can then make the go or no-go decisions about which projects are going to move forward. Uh, we'll uh, document our completed projects and do the lessons learned. We will hopefully, and you know that's a word that we probably shouldn't use in project management, but we would want to make sure that the uh, projects and programs that we have completed have helped us to achieve our strategic goals. And then what we do is we reset our strategic goals pretty much on a one, three, five year basis. Every year we're revisiting our strategies. Uh, putting it all together, this is the portfolio management uh, cycle. We set the goals. <clears throat> we select the right projects. And I have to emphasize the right projects. Those that are going to have the greatest economic uh, return, the greatest value add, uh, those things that are going to help both financially and in a non-financial way, what we call tangible or intangible benefits, we have to prioritize. We can't work on everything. So we have, um, uh, you know, in, I think uh, Peter also mentioned, we have limited resources. We, we don't have uh, uh, unlimited money and unlimited resources and unlimited time, so we have to prioritize. We place them into the various portfolios and buckets. Uh, we use our methodology to manage the projects. We review project performance on a regular and consistent basis. We reprioritize re based on business needs. We might terminate some of those projects and uh, re reallocate our resources. We will continue with evaluating project, uh, projects and programs, deliver the successful project, do well lessons learned, and then uh, again, go back to our uh, strategic goal planning. So that is uh, kind of uh, uh, a quick summary and high-level view of portfolio management. And at this point in time, I am looking to see if we have any uh, additional questions. So let's see what we have out there. Okay, uh, we, may we have, a, have this slide deck? That's part being shown now, and the answer is absolutely. Um, <clears throat> We have excellent slides. Hello from Toronto. Would love to have more details on the book Peter had just mentioned. Uh, Peter, would you like to uh, comment on some of those books that you had uh, referenced? Okay. Just checking to see if Peter is still with us. Sorry, I was muted. Okay, okay. yeah, there were, uh, we had a question about the, a, a little bit more elaboration on some of the books that you mentioned. Uh, well, was there any a specific book that the person uh, requested information about, or? Uh, it or says, not? okay, it's just saying, uh, hello from Toronto, would love to have more details on the book Peter just mentioned. So. Um, uh, I wonder if that was the, uh, well, the, uh, are, am I showing my screen at okay, this point? Okay, uh, if we can, Kay, would you uh, ask, uh, would you uh, give Peter back the screen, we'll share the screen back to uh, Peter so he can look at his slides again? Yep, there we go, okay. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, this first set of books uh, all the way down to predictably irrational and even including signal and noise, which is statistics. These are uh, essentially behavioral economics and so on, and they're fascinating and wonderful uh, and full of stuff that will uh, give you a perspective that you would not get any other way. The Wheelwright and Clark is one of my favorite books in management, in portfolio management. Uh, Wheelwright and Clark were at Harvard for many years in the business school. Clark was, I think, the head of it, uh, and they're elsewhere now. Uh, but that's an early book. It was done in 1995, I think, or sometime around then, uh, on uh, leading product development specifically, and it had a great deal to do with portfolio management, and in particular, with the r role of the senior executives trying to encourage them to be responsible for process within their organizations. And then the other references are uh, to PMI surveys and so forth. The last one, I encourage everyone on this call to look at this TED Talk on the internet. Hans Rosling is a public health statistician and expert at uh, a university in Sweden. And it is the most revealing use of 
graphics that I've ever seen. And it changes your view of the world when you look at this. So I can't recommend this uh, last reference uh, higher than that. Okay. I, um, what we're, we're being asked if we can post the link in chat, and we will certainly uh, get that link posted uh, in, in the follow-up uh, to the webinar. Um, another book that was mentioned that there's in the questions is, uh, is, is a book It's by Gary Herkins, H-E-E-R-K-E-N-S, and he wrote the book The Business Savvy Project Manager, and if you are a portfolio manager or a program manager or if you were a project manager aspiring to uh, get to that level of program and portfolio management, uh, I would highly recommend that, that, that particular book. Uh, that book is actually associated with a course that Gary delivers for PMI Seminars World. Uh, the, it's a crash course a uh, crash MBA course in project management that is delivered over four days in uh, <clears throat> PMI Seminars World, if you want to look out for that. Um, I also want to mention again that uh, Peter brought this up, that in March of next year, uh, there will be the Resource uh, Planning Summit. Uh, and they've had this successfully delivered this summit in Chicago, Baltimore, New Orleans, and a few other places. And uh, I highly recommend you visit his website, get information about that. And it is definitely not your a average uh, project management seminar. This is about business. This is about efficiency and value and uh, you know, some very, very, very key elements of portfolio management. So um, I, I highly recommend it if there's a way that you can get to New York City in March of next year. Uh, that information will be posted. Um, available on the website. Uh, you can contact Peter and his uh, team uh, at any time to get more information about that. Um, do we have any other questions uh, in connection with the information that was presented? Okay. Oh, PDUs. Okay, so um, uh, yes indeed. So, okay, I'm going to ask you if you would switch back uh, so that I have control of the screen and I'll just show you what we have here in terms of uh, PDU information. Okay, so this is the information that you need. This is still a category B PDU, one PDU, portfolio management, resource planning, uh, providers, Blue Marble Enterprises, and PDWare. Today's date, the process groups are initiating planning and executing. The knowledge areas, specifically communications and uh, uh, human resources, and, and probably scope management also. And it is in the talent triangle under strategic planning. So if you have any questions about that, you can send a, a note to uh, myself at uh, salatuspmp at msn.com, and Peter's uh, email is there. I'd be happy for, pe for people to contact uh, Peter, and they, they could provide you with more information about what their company does. Um, I, I've uh, learned uh, through my many contacts with Peter and, and his team that they are uh, premier experts in the area of, of resource planning, and it's, it's, they're, they're people that you probably really want to talk to uh, and get some insight from them. So. Uh, with that, uh, I don't see any other questions, so uh, I have a question here about adding some polls in here, and we have a couple of poll questions. I'm going to see if I can bring them up and uh, I'll ask you a couple of questions, and they're saying there are no polls associated with this webinar, so I guess we're not going to do that. For some reason, uh, I am unable to access my poll questions, and I'm going to try again. Uh, unfortunately, nope, they're not coming up. So, oh, so what can we do? Frank, I see that we do have a poll available here. It's on display. My organization has an effective process for efficient resource planning. Do you see that as well? Uh, I'm not seeing it, but uh, that's a good thing. Because I'm seeing the responses to it. Uh, we're seeing about 50% are somewhat agreeing and 31% are disagreeing. We have 43% of the vote in. If so we, it, looks, it, it looks like we have a very small uh, a number of people that are agreeing with that statement. If we close this poll, we'll be able to show the results to all the viewers. So would you like me to close it now? Uh, yes, definitely. All right. And then we'll share those results. Okay, 
So it does look like most people are somewhat agreeing to that statement. We do have two other polls that we can pull up if you'd like us to, Frank. Okay, let's go to the next one. For some reason, I am unable to access the questions, but if you would just read out the question for me since I can't see it either. Sure. The next poll says, project portfolio management is a critical success factor in any project-based organization. And the answers are coming in. And the results are showing most people strongly agree with that statement. Yeah, look, 90% of the people are agreeing with that statement. Excellent. Yes. And, okay, and there's one more question, Kay. Yes, your last poll question is, um, my organization would benefit significantly if it improved its resource planning capability. Strongly agree, somewhat agree, or disagree. And the answers are coming in as most people are strongly agreeing at 78%. I'll close that and show the results because people are fast here. And there's our results with by far most people strongly agreeing with that final poll. Okay, so uh, Peter, I think that you, you made an impression on, on the things that you had, had mentioned, uh, that portfolio management, resource planning, uh, they're, they're, they're kind of one and the same, they're, they're definitely strategic, uh, that most organizations are not really stepping up to the, the need to do it, uh, they need to have the right tools in place, they have to have the right uh, leadership in place to, to, uh, to make it happen, and um, I think that uh, we have uh, provided some uh, pretty useful information. So I'd like to uh, thank everybody for, for being part of the program and uh, thank Peter for taking the time to actually be with us today and share this information. And uh, any of the questions that we have not answered and the slides and the decks and the uh, recording will be posted over the next couple of days. Uh, we will have this uh, available at uh, www.internationalpmday.org. And again, I highly recommend that you contact Peter and his team at PDWare for additional questions and some insights about resource planning. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for, for joining and uh, be on the lookout for, for webinars coming up in the near future. And also, if you are inclined to give a presentation, if you have a certain subject or topic that you would like to share with project managers around the world, please send me an email and see if we can arrange to, to have you present to this audience. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. And again, Peter, thank you for your time. And Kay also, you, Kay Weiss from Successful Projects, who is um, just always there when she's needed. And I tell you, you know, I, can, I couldn't do much without Kay. So Kay, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you all.